Performing music live on stage is a completely different skill than playing your instrument for a recording session. Just because you're good at the one does not mean you're going to be good at the other. I've worked with a lot of great musicians who completely stumble in the studio environment. So when it comes time for a band or musician to finally get themselves recorded, they're often in for a rude awakening as they try to adapt to the demands of the studio process. So if you're planning on getting yourself or your band professionally recorded at a premium rate, or even if you're getting yourself that discount rate at a friend or family's amateur studio, I still recommend that you become highly aware of the biggest issues that will waste time, energy, and ultimately lead to a less desirable product. These first few tips are directed to anyone who's entering the studio, and then later on I'll direct some advice to specific musician roles like the bass, guitar, and drums and vocals. To begin, I think the most important thing you can do is have your stuff written before you go to the studio. I know this sounds like common sense, but as somebody who's done a lot of producing, I'm astonished at how many people will book studio time without having all the details figured out. They don't know how the outro is supposed to go, or they don't really have the bridge written, or they're not sure what the lyrics are supposed to be for this one part. Now, there's two kinds of producers out there. There's the kind of producer that will hold your hand and walk you through this process and help you fix that little problem, and that way the session goes smoothly. But there's also the kind of producer that just leaves you out to dry, hits record, and then whatever you do, they just ship out and it's your fault for having a completely bad session. So this is why I highly recommend you book a pre-production session with anyone you're recording with. Try to figure out what kind of producer are they. Are they going to assist you with little issues that you may not be aware of, or are they just the kind of producer who sits back, hits record, and lets things run? The next thing I would definitely prepare is practicing to a click track. So much of modern production is recorded to a click track that not practicing it ahead of time can lead to a disaster in the studio. I can't tell you how many sessions were ruined because somebody couldn't play to a click. Now, not every session is going to be recorded to a click, and certain bands demand that they don't be played to a click. But for the most part, and especially these days where everything's being done remotely due to COVID, a lot of it is done on the click map. And it's such an important part of the modern process that by not practicing your parts ahead of time to a click, you're basically asking for problems. Third, I really encourage you to not use the studio as a place to improvise. Once again, this goes back to writing things first, but just because you're a great lead player and you're able to shimmer people in the live environment because you're feeding off the energy of the crowd, well, when you're in that sterile studio environment setting and it's just the mixing engineer and your drummer and you're supposed to lay the magic down, A lot of times you can't find the motivation in the inspiration and things fall flat. A lot of good lead players suffer from studio paralysis, so it's highly advised to not rely on some magic source of inspiration when it comes time to lay things down in stone. Of course, there are exceptions to this. If you're a great improviser, if you're somebody like David Gilmour, who notoriously improvised a lot of his solos, but once again, these are people that had a ton of experience in the studio. So if you're not experienced with a studio setting, I would demand that you write your parts, your uh, leads ahead of time. And this also goes with drum fills. I've worked with a lot of drummers who play different drum fills at different times. And this annoys me for two reasons. One, it makes drum editing a lot harder. But two, it shows me that the drum fills weren't written with intent. They were just kind of felt in the moment. But I believe good drummers are working with the other instruments in the band. And they're kind of setting some things in stone and the other musicians are kind of working off that. So as a general rule, I would just refrain from using the studio as a place to improvise. And this goes to my last point, that the studio is a place to get work done. Over the decades, we've highly romanticized this idea of being in the studio and taking our Instagram shots and hanging out there and, you know, spending all year in the studio and that's where the magic happens. That's not really what it's like. You know, I mean, yes, there's instances of that, but, you know, it's a place where work needs to get done. Somebody needs to get paid. Somebody needs to pay bills and they're trying to get this session done as soon as possible. Somebody's got a job to go to and every hour that's spent working on something that could have been done at home brings the session down. So, unless you're booking a $10 million studio with hot tubs and caterers and you know, then yeah, you can spend some time and hang out and have fun. But most recording sessions don't work or look that way. So don't treat them that way. I'm sorry, I know that's not very fun, but I will guarantee you it will lead to a more productive session. But now I'd like to talk about some more specific and nuanced things that I have personally seen drag down a studio session. And first, let's talk about you guitarists out there. One of the biggest problems I encounter when recording guitarists is their inability to play the exact same thing two different times. A lot of modern guitar parts are double tracked. You'll play a riff and you'll pan it all the way to the left speaker. (laughs) 
Then you'll play that identical riff a different time and you'll pan it all the way to the right speaker. Getting two tight tracks like this gives us a great stereo sound. Now what's important here is that you have to record the part twice. You can't just copy paste it in your DAW, you actually have to record it twice and it has to be as close to perfectly identical as you can get. But if you're just a little bit sloppy on the one or if you're doing something slightly different or if you're just riffing and kind of improvising with it and jamming with it, then you get this, this sloppiness between the double track that really ruins the tight production that most tracks are looking for. So once again, this goes back to write your parts, even if it means physically write them down. I cannot stress how much more preparation happening at home will assist the studio process. My next piece of advice to guitarists is do not get too attached to your guitar tone. Live tone and studio tone are completely different things. And a lot of time, good producers are thinking about the, the, the bigger picture. They're thinking about mixing your guitar with the kick drum and the bass guitar and the layers. So you might be listening to your, your guitars and thinking they'll sound really weak. Well, that's because the producer's hopefully thinking about something bigger than you're thinking of. And with the versatility of VST technology for guitar amps, uh, a lot of guitar players from the live world are resi resistant to using VSTs, but I'm telling you, they're far more versatile. And by using them, you're gonna have more options. And more options mean more chances for a good mix. So my advice is don't get too attached to your guitar tone before you get into the studio. Hopefully you've got a producer that's good enough where you can trust him to make a lot of those decisions with you. And now some advice for the bass players out there. One of the biggest problems I encounter in the studio is bass players who are letting notes ring out between one another. This is a technique issue, and it's one of the most common technique issues that ruins my mix. Two notes that ring out together in the low end immediately create this low dissonant fog. And even if this just happens for microseconds, it clouds things up. It means a kick drum will be less audible. It means a low guitar note won't stick out as much. Now, good bass players don't really have this problem, but it is one of those amateur moves that I see a lot that does interfere with a good mix. So really watch out for it. Another big issue with bassists is writing parts that just can't be heard in the studio. Uh, they might look cool on stage, but arrangement is a big part of finishing a mix and producing something that sounds good. And a lot of times those arrangement problems don't really get worked out in a bassist's mind until they hear what things sound like when it's being recorded. For example, I can write a bass line that sounds really cool and it might include something cool like harmonics. But if that's happening underneath this groove with these guitar tones, you're really not going to be able to hear that interesting bass work. So it's really just taking up space. It's added energy, it's added effort, and you're not even hearing anything. So the big skill that bassists need to develop after they've been introduced to the studio setting is arrangement. Understanding what really should you be playing at specific moments so it stands out in the mix or if you don't want it to stand out in the mix. These next few tips are for drummers. One of the most time consuming things I can possibly do as a producer is edit bad drums. And we're not just talking about timing, we're talking about dynamics as well. When snare hits are inconsistent or when some kick drum hits are really weak and other ones are really loud. So once again, this is a technique thing, but most people don't recognize that it's an issue until they get to the studio and their producers yelling at them for you know not playing things consistently. 
yes, there's a lot of things we can use in the studio to fix this. We have compressors and gates and transient shapers, but that's just more time and energy. And if you're paying your producers by the hour, you want less and less of that to be done. Now, in my opinion, the drummers really have the most important role in the entire recording process because most songs start with the drums as the foundational layer, which means that drummers really need to know the songs perfectly, backwards and forwards, without the aid of their band. A lot of times, the producer will want to record the drums first, and that way everything else can sync up to those drums. And being able to just put the drummer into the drum room with the click track and have them play the entire track without the entire band there to help them out on what section they're on, that's pretty important time-saving stuff. Now, I personally think that the most important element of any song for the listener is the vocals. I think a bad vocal track will ruin a song for the public, even if everything else is amazing. So if you're a vocalist going into the recording studio, try to remember that studio singing is different from live singing. Mic technique is very important, and you can just search here on YouTube for studio mic technique. A lot of live singers ignore mic technique because the whole point is to be loud and flamboyant and to be the centerpiece, but that doesn't work all the time in the studio. You have to maintain your distance from the mic. You have to be able to reduce your plosives, your P's and your B's by, you know, keeping your angles right. You don't want to be cupping the mic when you're in the studio. That's something that really only happens in the live setting. Also, vocalists, memorize your lyrics. Don't rely on looking at your phone where you're looking down at it and you're not projecting into the microphone. Or you're holding a piece of paper or you're crinkling it around, switching through. No, just memorize your lyrics. It's a professional setting and you're going to save yourself a lot of time and um, a, a, you're going to get a better product if your lyrics are memorized and write your vocal harmonies. I have seen hours and hours wasted in the studio where a vocalist says, hey, what if we add harmonies? And they didn't write them ahead of time and they don't know how to write them. And they're not singing harmonies. They're just singing disasters. Harmonies are pretty complicated. If you're not naturally gifted at it, you're gonna need somebody that knows some music theory to help you out with that process. Now, when this happens in my sessions, what I end up doing is just writing this, the harmonies for them because I don't wanna spend two hours letting them try to figure it out. And usually, the result that I give them, you know, the band says, oh yeah, that's good enough. But you don't want your producer writing your music for you. You want them producing your music for you. And lastly, for you vocalists, don't be repulsed by the idea of pitch correction. Even if your song is a grunge song and it's supposed to sound like garbage, there's still moments where pitch correction can help. And good producers don't avoid pitch correction because it's cheating. No, they use pitch correction as a tool to improve the final product. And that might mean moving something in tune. That might mean moving something out of tune. So when if you see your producer pulling up something like auto-tune or Melodyne, don't get disgusted and don't get freaked out. I mean, they usually have something in mind that you're not thinking about. Once again, they're thinking about the bigger picture. My last few notes are on keyboard players entering the recording studio. And that is, you're all good. Most of my experiences with keyboard players coming to the recording studio is they're pretty well prepared. They can usually take direction pretty well. This is probably because most people that play the keyboard were taught through piano lessons, which is pretty formal and teaches you how to read music, teaches you how to write chord progressions and, you know, understand a little bit more of, of formalizing these creative concepts. But the one piece of actual advice I would give keyboard players is just to talk to your producer with what kind of gear is going to be available to you. Are you going to have to bring your own weighted keys? Is there a grand piano available? Are you going to be working with MIDI? These are kind of things you do want to work out ahead of time because you don't want to be surprised with the equipment when you do come to the studio. Now, now that just about does it. I could go on for hours about different mistakes I've seen people make and how to fix them, but I really do think these are the big offenders. These are the ones you should really watch out for if you're in a band or if you're an independent musician looking to get your music done or if you're a producer trying to smooth out your sessions. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you learned something from it. If you enjoyed this video, please thank my Patreon supporters for making it possible. They are the reason that these videos exist. So if you'd like to support the production of these videos, you can join them at my Patreon or you can consider buying my music theory and songwriting course, which is available on my website. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.